Okay, today we're going to talk about criminal charges, and um, as opposed to civil charges, which would be you'd be sued for money, like in a credit card case or mortgage fraud. So in a criminal case against you, because why would you care about it if it's not against you? You've had to have done something. And once you've done something, then you get the attention of law enforcement or you uh, could have the attention of somebody else. And so there's only a few ways to get uh, uh, charged. The first of all, in, under the laws of the state of California and the state of, you know, any state, and the United States of America, there are requirements that have to be met before you can be brought up on charges. Those requirements are stated clearly in your little constitution, and if you don't read this book, you'll never know what the prohibitions are on government agents from acting against you. Because the constitution is not list a list of your rights. The constitution is a prohibition on those people that have an oath of office from doing things to you. Okay, so you have to have had a grand jury indictment. That would be one way to be charged. The district attorney goes to the grand jury and decides, hey, we have some evidence against this person and the grand jury foreman will talk amongst the uh, 21 or 23 people that are on the grand jury. And of course, it's never a lawful grand jury because a lawful grand jury under the Magna Carta would have to have 25 on it. And the, and the uh, district attorney will completely control the information that gets to the grand jury. The grand jury is a, was designed to be a wonderful instrument to keep government corruption in check because anyone could come to the grand jury with evidence and the grand jury could look at it and go, you know what, the prosecutor uh, committed a wrong when he charged this person on uh, evidence he knew was foul and uh, therefore we're going to charge him with... Um, you know, criminal activity. So, but they have it set up today so that the district attorney basically will not allow anybody to present evidence before the grand jury, and he's the gatekeeper, and he wants to be the only party that presents evidence in front of the grand jury. If you looked into it, you'd probably find that there's no law that says you can't provide evidence to the grand jury. And one way to do that would be to find out who the grand jury foreman is in your area and send him registered mail, uh, green card, signature green card, uh, restricted delivery where he has to sign for it personally. And if the district attorney intercepts it and takes his mail, that would be mail fraud. You could charge him with uh, criminal activity as mail fraud. Okay, so, so we know that you can be charged if you have a grand jury indictment. The other thing that you could be charged with would be if there was a warrant. Now in the old days, what they considered was if you were doing some activity that wasn't completely dangerous to the community, right, but it was something the community didn't like, uh, the police or somebody would come to the, uh, a judge and sw swear an oath that he witnessed activity that was unlawful on your part, and the judge would sign a warrant, and then the officer would go out with the warrant and arrest you under the order of the judge. Now that's a thing of the past. We all know that. There is hardly ever any warrants issued. But that is the way it was supposed to be when the Constitution was founded in the late 1700s. And it was that way probably up until the late 1800s. I mean, there were very few laws against doing what you wanted to do. I mean, anyway. So we go, we go on to uh, a judge signed warrant. Then, um, then the warrant has to be issued upon probable cause. So they bypassed the issuing of the warrant and it came to the conclusion that an officer could arrest you on probable cause. So you'd have to understand what probable cause is. Because if we don't understand what probable cause is, then um, there's, how do you have any justification and authority for an arrest? Let's first read what um, our little constitution says about um, what is the requirement, right, before they can seize you or your property. The Fourth Amendment, search and arrest warrants. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, that would be, you know, my body, houses, papers, and effects, so that's all my property, 
against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation now what's an oath or affirmation I mean if we don't know these things then we're gonna lose our uh, rights an oath or affirmation is where you swear under penalty of perjury but if you swear under penalty of perjury without doing it in front of somebody who can hear your sworn oath then it's just a verification. It's verification, but it's not an oath. An oath has to be done in front of somebody who can hear your oath. And, well, anybody can hear your oath, pretty much, but we have to go back to the Bible. The Bible is law, and in the Bible it says a fact is established by two or more witnesses. So, in the modern day world a fact is established by swearing an oath in front of a notary or in front of a judge or in front of a police officer somebody who's uh, authorized to hear an oath right and if it's not done that way then you're gonna have to have at least two witnesses that swear that you swore everything on your affidavit was true to become an oath so we have to understand that so when an officer writes you a ticket and on the bottom of the ticket it says I swear under penalty of perjury everything above is true that's not an oath because it didn't happen in front of somebody authorized to hear it okay by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized okay so if they come into your house and start looking around and do a sneak and peek and investigate everything in your house, every, everybody's got something in their house that's illegal, right? Everybody has something in their house that's illegal. That's why the warrant has to state that I'm searching for drugs in the drawer, in the dresser, in um, Mark's bedroom. Okay, that's specific. You can, if you find it in Mark's bedroom, fine. But if you don't find it in the drawer in Mark's bedroom, then you don't get to search the rest of the house. That's the way it works. So that's the um, United States Constitution. And let's go to the California Constitution. And I highly recommend whichever state you're in, you get a copy of the state constitution and all the authorities of where, where law comes from for that state, such as, you know, um, in here, the first thing that the law comes from for California's Constitution is the Magna Carta. So you can use the Magna Carta as law. Declaration of Independence, law. Articles of Confederation, law. Okay. So we'll go to, um, <clears throat> this is the 1879 Constitution, which I would not use. But I'm going to read it out of you because that's what they're using. Article 1, Section 13, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable seizures and searches may not be violated, and a warrant may not issue except on probable cause supported by oath or affirmation, particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Same wording exactly. And I would not use the US Constitution by itself because you know there are cases that say you don't have any rights under the US Constitution so I would start off with using your state constitution and enforcing your rights under your state constitution because you dwell in the state I wouldn't use the word residence or anything like that but you dwell in the state and the state law should govern what goes on you can use both law so that you know it's just an ad if if you have the you have rights under this law and under this law and you put both of them in there hey, you're co you're covered you're better off the rules on fourth amendment because you know once you start understanding how things are um, not done lawfully you'll have a much easier chance of arguing it one of the big arguments nobody ever makes in a criminal trial is there was no warrant for my arrest. No warrant. So that's a defect. There has to be a warrant. And we're going to go through and show you why. Okay, the Fourth Amendment uh, case that's most off, often cited is Terry versus Ohio. So we're going to read that. Four. 
The Fourth Amendment applies to, quote, stop and frisk procedures such as those followed here. Whenever a police officer accosts an individual and restrains his freedom to walk away, he has seized that person within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment. On the motion to suppress the guns, the prosecution took the position that they had seized following a search incident to a lawful arrest. The trial court rejected this theory, stating that it would be stretching the facts beyond reasonable comprehension, quote, to find that Officer McFadden had had probable cause to arrest the men before he patted them down for weapons. So, in other words, did he witness them committing a crime? Because that would give him probable cause. If he didn't, and he just decided to search them without any reason, just because he had a suspicion, there's no probable cause there. They weren't committing any crime. However, the court defined the defendant's motion on the ground that Officer McFadden, on the basis of his experience, had reasonable cause to believe that the def defendants were conducting themselves suspiciously and some interrogation should be made of their action, quote. Our first task is to establish at which, what point in this encounter the Fourth Amendment becomes relevant. Because they're saying that the party in this case has Fourth Amendment rights, right? Obviously, otherwise, it wouldn't matter. That is, we must decide whether and, whether and when Officer McFadden seized Terry and whether and, th and when he conducted a, quote, search. There is some question in the use of terms such as, quote, stop and, quote, frisk, and such police conduct is outside the purview of the Fourth Amendment because neither action rises to the level of a, quote, search or, quote, seizure within the meaning of the Constitution. We emphatically reject this notion. It is quite plain that the Fourth Amendment governs seizures of the person which do not eventuate in a trip to the station house and prosecution for crime. The minute you're not free to go, you've been seized, you are under arrest, you're in custody. Arrests in traditional ter terminology. It must be recognized that whenever a police officer accosts an individual and restrains his freedom to walk away, he has seized that person. And it is nothing less than sheer torture of the English language to suggest that a careful exploration of the outer surfaces of a person's clothing all over his or her body in an attempt to find weapons is not a, quote, search. Moreover, I mean, it might not be a search if you just looked at him, but the minute you put your hands on him, you're searching. Moreover, it, was simply, it is simply fantastic to urge that such a procedure performed in public by a policeman while the civilian stands helpless. Why would he be helpless? Oh, yeah, the, man's, the policeman's armed and commanding him to do things, right? So it's a, it's a seizure by force of arms. Perhaps facing a wall with his hands raised is a, quote, petty indignity. It is a serious intrusion upon the sanctity of the person which may inflict great indignity and arouse strong resentment. I mean, how embarrassing. You got the police have you up against the wall and searching you without having witnessed any crime, so they have no right to do so. It's an, it's an indignity. And it is not to be taken lightly. And that's from Terry versus Ohio, 392 U.S. 1 in 1968. So it's not ancient history. We'll read a few more Fourth Amendment cases. Held, where the defendant makes a substantial preliminary showing that a false statement knowingly and intentionally or with reckless disregard for the truth was included by the affiant in the warrant affidavit. Now, what's an affiant? An affiant is somebody who's making an affidavit. An affidavit is sworn. So in order to get a warrant, you need to swear in front of somebody who can hear your oath. So they're saying, included by the affiant in the warrant affidavit. 
the person who witnessed the crime has to go in front of a judge and submit an affidavit where he swears with first-hand knowledge that he witnessed a crime. Okay? And if the allegedly personal, if the allegedly false statement if, is necessary to the finding of probable cause, the Fourth Amendment as incorporated in the Fourteenth Amendment, and the reason they say that is because in or, some courts believe that in order to enforce the Bill of Rights in a state, that the only way that they can bring it in is through the 14th Amendment, which forces the states to abide by everything in the 14th Amendment. But, you know, I, that's why I would use the state constitutions. Requires that a hearing be held at the defendant's request. Now, what do we know about that? What if the defendant doesn't request it? You know, you lose your right. If you don't make the objection, you lose your right. So you have to make the objection. The objection has to be, there was no warrant, there was no probable cause. I deny that there was any probable cause and I have yet to see any proof of it. The trial court here therefore erred in refusing to examine the adequacy of the petitioner's proffer, this is the person who's complaining, of misrepresentation in the warrant affidavit. He's basically calling the cop a liar that, you know, he didn't state the truth on the, affid on the affidavit that caused the warrant to issue. To mandate an evidentiary hearing, the challenger's attack must be more than conclusory and must be supported by more than a mere desire to cross-examine. The alleged allegation of deliberate falsehood or of reckless disregard must point out specifically with supporting reasons the portion of the warrant affidavit that is claimed to be false. It must also be accompanied by an offer of proof. That's very important because we're going to discuss the importance of affidavits and offer of proof. You, if you make an offer of proof and they deny hearing you then you have uh, you know, you certainly have something that can be reversed because you made an offer you you made an the you made a request to offer proof which means you have a right to expo you know to put in evidence and if they say no we're not going to hear your evidence then you have a third world dictatorship star chamber kind of operation going on including affidavits or sworn or otherwise reliable statements of witnesses that's your offer of proof hey my statement is I swear that didn't happen. He says, I swear it did happen, and now you have he said, she said, and it's an, and you know, if, if they, they would have to have uh, more parties that are swearing in their, um, in their defense, or a satisfactory explanation of their absence. And that's from Franks versus Delaware. This is a Supreme Court case 438 U.S. 154 from 1978. So what happened in the old days? You know, in the old days, somebody um, witnessed a crime being committed and flagged down a policeman and said, hey, I saw Bob hit, uh, you know, this man over here with a shovel, right? I saw a crime being committed. There was misdemeanors, felonies, and breach of the peace. And a breach of the peace was an affray, a fist fight, a riot something where a public terror resulted and the people were uh, in fear of their life or in fear of getting beaten or something to that effect. If you had a fist fight between two people and they stopped fighting, it, it, uh, it became questionable whether you could arrest them for fighting. Yeah, I mean, not today. Today they've gone way past that. But in the, in the old days, when according to the Constitution, when they were operating more constitutionally, you couldn't do that. Okay, this is a case from 1884 called Tarod. It is plain from this fundamental enunciation, as well as well as from the books on a, of authority on criminal matters in the common law. Okay, it's not statutory law like today penal code, that's not common law, that the probable cause referred to and which must be supported by oath or affirmation must be submitted to the committing magistrate himself. Why is that important? And not merely to an official accuser, like the prosecutor, 
district attorney, so that he, the magistrate, may exercise his own judgment on the sufficiency of the ground for believing the accused person guilty. So who makes the determination? The magistrate makes the determination that there's reasonable probable cause because a policeman thinks everything he does has reasonable probable cause. That's the way he thinks. So only a judge who actually can decipher the difference between real probable cause and none should make that decision. And this ground must amount to a probable cause or belief or suspicion of the party's guilt. In other words, the magistrate ought to have before him the oath of the real accuser. So in other words, somebody who's actually witnessed the crime. So if the policeman hears it from somebody else, the way it works is the person he hears it from, he takes an affidavit. That person swears under penalty of perjury before the policeman who hears his oath and signs on, on it as the witness to it. And then they take that affidavit in front of a judge. Well, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But here, here they're saying he ought, the judge ought to have him before him the oath of the real accuser presented either in the form of an affidavit, there we go, or taken down by himself on a personal examination. So who's himself? The judge. And who would he be personally examining? The officer. Right? Exhibiting the facts on which the charge is based. So, there, so that tells me that there has to be facts involved. And we're going to discuss the difference between no facts and facts. <laughs> and on which the belief or suspicion of guilt is founded. Quote, the rule which was established was that the warrant should issue, quote, only upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation of the person making the charge, in which should be stated the facts within his own knowledge constituting the grounds of such belief or suspicion. And that's United States versus Tarot, 20, Federal Reporter, 623 in 1884. Facts. Are there any facts? Oh, you've been arrested for violating penal code, uh, you know, 682. Uh, that's not a fact. That's a number, and there's no facts. Facts would be let's say penal code 682 and this is not true but let's say penal code 682 said anybody who received stolen goods is guilty of a misdemeanor so the facts would be on september 20th at nine o'clock at night i went into the pawn shop and the owner showed me a, a handy cam and when i looked at it it had the engraved owner's name in there and the then the owner had reported it stolen the fact that he's in possession of it is, is I'm making, that, those are facts, right? The fact is I went into there, I described the person, I described the time, the place, what I saw, those become facts. You violated Penal Code 682, that's not a fact. Not a fact. And they don't provide facts, you see. And why not? Because then they would have to defend their position that those facts were true. So they just leave all the facts out completely. So there's no facts. No facts to prove. So let's read uh, County of Riverside. And uh, this is uh, uh, Chief Justice Scalia. Who, if you don't know him, you probably should. He's a current uh, Supreme Court judge. And this is from 1991. Quote, the issue before us today is of precisely that sort. We, as we have recently had occasion to explain the Fourth Amendment's prohibition of unreasonable seizures insofar as it applies to seizure of the person preserves for our citizens the traditional protections against unlawful arrest afforded by the common law. Oh, so in 1991, he's saying that we have common law rights still. Whereas if you, anywhere you go in court, or in the legislature or anywhere, they're going to look at common law as a dirty word, right? And yet that's the basis for the Constitution. It's the basis for all the states' constitutions. All the states are common law states except Louisiana. And Louisiana is like quasi, but it's um, French civil law. One of those... 
One of the most important of those was that a person arresting a suspect without a warrant must deliver the arrestee to a magistrate, quote, as soon as he reasonably can. Well, when's that? Like three months later? As soon as he reasonably can. And then he cites all the, you know, supporting stuff, which is, you know, a lot of it's pleas of the crown. <laughs> Blackstone commentaries. These are in old English law, right? Quote, it's the duty of a person arresting anyone on suspicion of felony to take him before a justice as soon as he reasonably can, quote. And that was from a case in 1837. Quote, when a constable arrests a party for treason or felony, he must take him before a magistrate to be examined as soon as he reasonably can. Now that word is very important. We're going to come back to that a lot. Examined. Examination. The practice in the United States was the same. And he quotes 1962 case, 1909 case, 1907 case, 1883 case, 1872 case, 1861 case, and an 1849 case, and a 1940 case. Oh my god, moral cases. 1884, too, also. It was clear, moreover, that the only element bearing upon the reasonableness of delay was not such circumstances as the pressing need to conduct further investigation. Now, does anybody uh, get what's going on today? Today they arrest you, they don't tell you what the charges are, they don't bring you before a magistrate, and then days later, or weeks later, they change what they told you they were arresting you for, and decide to charge you with something completely different. That's completely unlawful. So. The only element bearing upon the reasonableness of delay was not circumstances as the pressing need to conduct further investigation, but the arresting officer's ability once the prisoner had been secured. As we can't go around with a shotgun walking out of 7-Eleven looking for more gas stations to rob. You have to reasonably secure him, right? Safety for the community. To reach a magistrate who could issue the needed warrant for further detention. 1962 case, 1934 case, 1913 case, 1900 case, 1897 case, 1896 case, 18, 19, 1894 case, 1881 case. I mean, the cases that support these opinions are huge, right? I mean, this is a long list. 1869 case, 1871 case, and an 1830. 67 case and 1860 case. Any detention beyond the period within which a warrant could have been obtained rendered the officer liable for false imprisonment. You know what I'm going to call it? If you arrest me without charging me and holding me without charging me, without a warrant, it's kidnapping. That's what it is. What you did was kidnap me if you don't charge me and get a, a judge signed warrant. And that was from Riverside versus McLaughlin, which also has a famous uh, quote in there that uh, they have to take you before a magistrate within 48 hours. And that's uh, a United States Supreme Court decision, 500 U.S. 44 in 1991. So once again, we're going through this, if you get arrested, there has to have been a grand jury indictment or a warrant, or they can arrest you with probable cause without a warrant, but, right? And the but is they have to take you before a judge. Quote, the judges of this court were unanimously of opinion that the warrant of commitment was illegal for want of stating some good cause. Hey, where's the facts, right? Supported by oath. Where's the oath? Where's the oath? And where are the facts? And that's ex parte versus uh, v. Buford, 7 U.S. Uh, 3 Cranch, 448, in 1806. 7 U.S. 448, excuse me. Quote, even when the person who makes the constitutionally required oath or affirmation is a lawyer, like the district attorney, right? Because oftentimes the district attorney's office is the one who's praying for a warrant. 
The only function that she performs in giving sworn testimony is that of a witness. Quote. The Fourth Amendment requires that arrest warrants be based, quote, upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation, a requirement that may be satisfied by an indictment returned by a grand jury, but not by the mere filing of criminal charges in an unsworn information signed by the prosecutor. So once again, even if the prosecutor sw signed under penalty of perjury, what they would be doing would be committing perjury because if they didn't if they weren't there when you were arrested how could they have witnessed a crime so it would be hearsay that they're swearing to somebody else told them information on information and belief that's hearsay right secondly like they said right in here the only testimony that they sworn testimony they can get is that of a witness they have to have witnessed it so, as you can see, I have lots of court cases on Fourth Amendment stuff. The point of the Fourth Amendment, which is often not grasped by zealous officers, is not that it denies law enforcement the support of the usual inferences which reasonable men draw from evidence. Yeah, I came up on the scene, there was a dead body oozing blood, and this man standing over it with a gun. I assumed he shot him. Okay, that's an inference. An inference is a fact that is elicited from other facts. Its protection consists in requiring that those inferences be draw by a, drawn by a neutral and detached magistrate instead of being judged by the officer engaged in the often competitive enterprise of ferreting out crime. My God, it's a competitive business. Maximum protection of individual rights could be assured by requiring a magistrate's review of the factual justification prior to any arrest. Oh my God, there's that word again, factual. To, but such a requirement would constitute an intolerable handicap for legitimate law enforcement. Thus, while the court has expressed a preference for the use of arrest warrants when feasible, it has never invalidated an arrest supported by probable cause solely because the officers failed to secure a warrant. Under this practical compromise, a policeman's on-the-scene assessment of probable cause provides legal justification for arresting a person suspected of crime and for a brief period of detention brief to take the administrative steps incident to arrest. Once the suspect is in custody, however, the reasons that justify dispensing with the magistrate's neutral judgment evaporate. There you go. There no longer is any danger that the suspect will escape or commit further crimes while the police submit their evidence to, to a magistrate. And while the state's reasons for taking summary action subside, the suspect's need for a neat, neutral determination of probable cause increases significantly. The consequences of prolonged detention may be more serious than interference occasioned by arrest. Pre-trial confinement may imperil the suspect's job, interrupt his source of income, and impair his family relationships. Hey, once you've been charged, it's a nightmare, and your whole family has to go through it. See court case from 1972. Even pre-trial release may be accompanied by burdensome conditions that affect a significant restraint of liberty. When the stakes are this high, the detached judgment of a neutral magistrate is essential if the Fourth Amendment is to furnish meaningful protection from unfounded interference with liberty. Accordingly, we hold that the Fourth Amendment requires a judicial determination of probable cause. Okay, get the, get the words in there. A judicial determination. The policeman is a member of the executive branch. A judge is a member of the judicial branch. As a prerequisite to extended restraint of liberty following arrest. The result has historical support in the common law. There's that word again. That has guided interpretation of the Fourth Amendment. 
1925 case. At common law, it was customary, if not obligatory, for an arrested person to be brought before a justice of the peace shortly after arrest. The justice of the peace would examine okay, the prisoner. So if you were arrested and you didn't go before of a judge for an examination, an examination, right? The policeman is there to to express to the to the judge what he witnessed, the facts he witnessed, and why he believes there's probable cause to issue a warrant. And you would be there to rebut his claims and tell your side of the story. Such as a friend of mine was arrested and they accused him of being drunk. But they're so lame they didn't even ask him to breathe into a breathalyzer. So I guess they really didn't think he was drunk. And if he had appeared in front of a magistrate immediately, half an hour later, and he was hammered, the judge would be able to tell whether he's hammered or not. If he's not hammered and he doesn't appear to be drunk, the judge would be able to notice that he's not drunk and throw out the charges of being drunk. That's why an examination in front of a magistrate immediately is really important. If there was, the suspect would be committed to jail or bailed pending trial, and if not, he would be discharged from custody. The initial determination of probable cause could also be reviewed by higher courts on a writ of habeas corpus. The practice furnished the model for criminal procedure in America immediately following the adoption of the Fourth Amendment. And this is from 1975 case Gerstein versus Pew et al. 420 U.S. 103. 420 U.S. 103 in 1975. <clears throat> it is a well-established rule that a consent search is unreasonable under the Fourth Amendment if the consent was induced by the deceit, trickery, and misrepresentation of the Internal Revenue Agent. And that's from uh, United States versus Tweel, 550 F. 2nd, 297, from the Court of Appeals, Fifth Circuit, 1977. Gee, when would the IRS agent try to deceive you into consenting to a search? <laughs> what about IRS agents? I mean, the police constantly try to deceive you into telling you that you are required to allow them to search you, or they just force you to force to search you. But if you don't object, then you don't really have any grounds. You have to object at the time. I don't consent to search because they're always recording you. So this is a case on probable cause. Quote, these long prevailing standards seek to safeguard citizens from rash and unreasonable interferences with privacy and from unfounded charges of crime. They also seek to give far leeway for enforcing the law in the community's protection. Because such situations which confront officers in the course of executing their duties are more or less ambiguous, room must be allowed for some mistakes on their part. Fine. Here's the biggie. But the mistakes must be those of reasonable men, acting on facts leading sensibly to their conclusions of probability. The rule of probable cause is a practical, non-technical conception affording the best compromise that has been found for accommodating those often opposing interests. And then we'll go down to, since Marshall's time, at any rate, it has come to mean more than bare suspicion. Probable cause exists where the facts and circumstances within their, the officer's, knowledge, and of which they had reasonably trustworthy information, are sufficient in them in themselves to warrant a man of reasonable caution in the belief that the offense has been or is being committed. And that's from Brinegar versus United States, another Supreme Court case, 338 U.S. 160 in 1949. Now part of the interesting aspect here is that you can be arrested if you're committing a crime, but very few people actually know the definition of crime and that most of the things that people get charged with these days are not crimes. So let's look at a few of the penal code, um, the laws in the state of California. I know this wouldn't uh, you know, affect any of the other states, but here we go. Penal code, this is why it's always worthwhile to get your state's penal code out and just go through it from top to bottom. I mean. It's uh, 
you know, it's boring stuff, but you're going to find some gold in there. Penal Code uh, 207. Every person who forcibly or by any other means of instilling fear steals or holds, takes or holds, detains or arrests any person in this state and carries the person into another country, state, or county, or into another part of the same county is guilty of kidnapping. Now, my definition of kidnapping that the police do would be any time you have taken me without taking me before a magistrate and charged me. If you're going to hold me for three days in jail and then release me on bail, you have kidnapped me. That's, you know what I'm saying? Kidnapped. And then here's Penal Code 145 to show you that law enforcement officers are required, required to take you before a magistrate. Penal Code 145. Every public officer or other person having arrested any person upon a criminal charge, I mean, how could you arrest him without a criminal charge, civil charge, who willfully delays to take such person before a magistrate having jurisdiction to take his examination, there's that word again, examination, I want you to become aware of it, is guilty of a misdemeanor. So every cop that doesn't take you before the judge immediately is guilty of a misdemeanor. You know how huge that is? It's huge. Penal Code 849. A. When an arrest is made without a warrant, like all of them, by a peace officer or private person, the person arrested, if not otherwise released, shall without unnecessary delay be taken before the nearest or most accessible, what? magistrate in the county in which the offense is triable and a complaint stating the charge against the arrested person person shall be laid before such magistrate you got to bring the charges you got to have the sworn oath in front of the magistrate stating the facts and you got to bring the party being charged in front of the magistrate and that way you could put your side of the story in. When are you going to get to tell your side of the story? Never. Okay, so let's talk about what if the sheriff is required to take you before a magistrate if he arrests you. How many times does a sheriff arrest somebody? Tons, right? California Government Code 26601. The sheriff shall arrest and take before the nearest magistrate for examination all persons who attempt or to commit or have committed a public offense. If the sheriff thinks that, that, that you've committed a public offense, what do you think an arrest is? You committed a public offense, which is the same as a crime. Public offense and crime are the same. Okay, the sheriffs can't enforce vehicle code laws in California. Well, actually in, uh, I think, Orange County they can. Government Code 26613 states, notwithstanding the provisions of Section 29601, the Board of Supervisors in a county having a population in this excess of 3 million, there's 56 counties in California and only one of them fits that criteria, may authorize the sheriff to enforce the provisions of the vehicle code in the unincorporated area of such county, but only upon county highways. In other words, you, the sheriff cannot enforce vehicle code violations except in Orange County, in a county of more than 3 million. It could be L.A. County. Vehicle code says you are arrested when stopped. California Vehicle Code, Section 40500. A. Whenever a person is arrested for any violation of this code not declared to be a felony, so that would be infractions and misdemeanors, or for a violation of an ordinance of a city or county relation to traffic offenses, and he or she is not immediately taken before a magistrate. As provided in this chapter, the arresting officer shall prepare in triplicate a written notice to appear in court. So if they don't cite you out with the ticket and they arrest you, under the vehicle code, they have to take you before a magistrate, not down to booking where you never get to see a judge. California Vehicle Code 40504A. 
the officer shall deliver one copy of the notice to appear. That's the ticket. To the arrested person. Oh, you didn't know that when you were pulled over for a broken taillight, you were arrested. Were you free to go? <laughs> Apparently not. And the vehicle code says it right here, that you were arrested. And once you got that ticket, you were getting it because you were the arrested person. And the arrested person, in order to secure release, must give his or her written promise to appear in court. Thereupon, the arresting officer shall forthwith release the person arrested from custody. Wow, every single traffic stop is an arrest. And in an arrest, they have to have probable cause that a crime was committed. The only problem is, infractions, speeding tickets, stoplights, and all that kind of stuff, infractions aren't crimes. I got court cases on that. Okay, this is a uh, California court case on showing that infractions aren't crimes. Section 16 of the Penal Code declares that, quote, crimes and public offenses include not only felonies and misdemeanors, but also infractions. Sections 19C and 104.2.5 of the Penal Code deprive a person accused of an infraction of the right of a, of a jury trial. Now, if you go to court and you demand a jury trial in a traffic ticket case, they will deny it to you. So you're, you don't have a right to a jury trial in a, a traffic case, you know, unless it's a misdemeanor or a felony. So infractions, you're, not, you're deprived of the right of a jury trial. Yet section 689 of the Penal Code declares that, quote, no person can be convicted of a public offense unless by verdict of a jury, quote. The 1968 amendment of section 16 of the Penal Code substituted the words, quote, crimes and public offenses include, quote, for the words, quote, crimes, how defined, crimes are divided into, quote. If the legislature intended to treat infractions as public offenses, See, there's the word. Public offense and crime are the same, okay, by the way. So if it's a public offense, it's a crime. It just means that it's a written law, man's law, that says if you do something, you're prohibited from doing it, right? It's a written, man's written law prohibiting you from doing something, as opposed to na natural law or God's law. If the legislature intended to treat infractions as public offenses, and if the charging of a public offense invokes the right to trial by jury, sections 19C and 104.2.5, which deny a jury to one who commits an infraction, conflict with section 689. However, the same 1968 legislature enacted section 19C, the pertinent amendment of section 16 and section 104.2.5. Yeah, I know. It's mind-numbingly boring, isn't it? Construing these sections in accordance with the precepts laid down in re K supra. This is the important part. We must conclude that it was not the intent of the legislature to enact inconsistent statutes and further that when it added the term, quote, public offense to section 16, it was not so categorizing infractions because if it did so, it would have caused inconsistency between sections 19C and 689 of the penal code. Support for this interpretation is found in the language of section 104.2.5, which states that a defendant, quote, charged with an infraction and with a public offense for which there is a right to a jury trial may be accorded a jury trial. Had the legislature intended that an infraction be treated as a public offense, it would have worded the statute differently. differently. For example, quote, an infraction and with some other public offense. And that was from uh, People vs. Battle in 1975. The other interesting thing is that uh, an infraction would be a unlawful bill of attainder because a bill of attainder or a bill of pains and penalties is outlawed by the Constitution as no state shall make any bills of attainder. Okay, so a bill of pains and penalties or a bill of attainder is legislated criminal activity where you don't get a jury to hear your case and decide whether you're guilty. We know that a jury 
can uh, nullify any act, right? A jury can vote that you're not guilty and you haven't violated any law, even though there is, you know, plenty of factual evidence that you did violate written law. And here's the bill of attainder. Legislative acts, no matter what their form, that apply either to named individuals or easily assert ascertainable members of a group in such a way as to inflict punishment on them without a judicial trial are bills of attainder prohibited by the Constitution. Thus, the Bill of Attainder Clause not only was intended as one implementation of the general principle of fractionalized power, in other words, the separation of powers, the uh, judicial function is exercised by the people as a jury, but also reflecting reflected the framers' belief that the legislative branch is not so well suited as politically independent judges and juries to the task of ruling upon the blameworthiness of and levying appropriate punishment upon specific persons. The best available evidence, the writings of the architects of our constitutional system, indicate indicates that the Bill of Attainder Clause was intended not as a narrow technical and therefore soon to be outmoded prohibition, but rather as an implementation of the separation of powers, a general safeguard against legislative e exercise of the judicial function, or more simply, trial by legislature. And that's from United States v. Brown, 381 U.S. 437, a Supreme Court case in 1965. And only a warrant, a warrant can only be signed by a judge. Penal Code 807. The magistrate is an officer having power to issue a warrant for the arrest of a person charged with a public offense. In California, you have to have a judge on duty 24-7. Penal Code 810A. The presiding judge of the Superior Court of, of, in a county shall, as often as is necessary, designate on a schedule not less than one judge of the court to be reasonably available on call as a magistrate for the setting of orders for discharge from actual custody upon bail, the issuance of search warrants, and for other such matters as may by the magistrate be deemed appropriate at all times when a court is not in session. That would be like 9 to 5. The officer in charge of a jail or other person the officer designates in which an arrested person is held in custody shall assist the arrested person. Since when did the jail staff ever assist you? Or the arrested person's attorney in contacting the magistrate on call as soon as possible for the purpose of obtaining release on bail. You've got to be kidding. You've got to be kidding. The magistrate never releases anybody on bail. I guarantee it. You have a right to three phone calls. You know, everybody I know that's been arrested has been denied any phone calls. Penal Code 851.5A. Immediately upon being booked and except where physically impossible, no later than three hours after arrest. An arrested person has the right to make at least three completed telephone calls as described in subdivision B. The arrested person shall be entitled to make at least three calls at no expense if the calls are completed to telephone numbers within the local calling area. Hey, you got to call home, you got to call your cousin, you got to call somebody, they can't charge you and you get three completed telephone calls. So if, if it's a uh, wrong number or if it's a, uh, you know, dial tone or something like that. Okay, let's read what the federal government feels the rules for a complaint are. This is the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, of which California's Evidence Code 451 says it's compulsory judicial notice to take notice of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. So in other words, they have to accept them, right? Rule three, the complaint. Now this is important because in every case where you're being charged, the complaint is the charge, right? Is a written statement of the essential facts. So if there's no essential facts, then there's 
then there's no real charge. You can't be charged if there's no facts stated constituting the offense charged. It must be made under oath before a magistrate judge, or if none is reasonably available, before a state or local judicial officer. Now, the district attorney is the executive branch. He's not a judicial officer, so it has to be in front of a clerk of the court. So you have to have an examination. Penal Code 872A. If, however, it appears from the examination that a public offense has been committed, that's a crime, and there is sufficient cause to believe that the defendant is guilty, the magistrate shall make or endorse on the complaint, right, an order signed by him or her to the following effect, quote, it appearing to me that the offense in the within complaint mentioned has been committed and that there is sufficient cause to believe that the within named AB, that'd be you, the guilty party, is guilty. I order that he or she be held to answer to the same. Okay, that becomes a warrant because he signs it. Now, B, notwithstanding section 1200 of the evidence code, the finding of probable cause may be based in whole or in part upon the sworn testimony of a law enforcement officer or honorably retired law enforcement officer relating to the statements of declarants made out of court offered for the truth of the matter stated. Declarants made out of court? That would be when somebody on the street signs an affidavit that he witnessed a crime and, the, and tells the officer and the officer arrests you based on that person's testimony. <clears throat> and then thing, one thing I love you know, most of all, the Penal Code 868, the examination shall be open and public. Hey, you want all your friends to come down and record it, right? I want them to be witnesses, and I want them to see what's going on at my examination. I don't care if it's two in the morning. I'm going to call my friends and have them come down and witness the examination. And anybody could witness the examination because it's public. That's like all trials are public. Have you ever seen them lock the doors and not let you in to a public trial? I have. <laughs> Conspiracy 182. If two or more persons conspire to commit any crime falsely and maliciously to indict another for any crime or to procure another to be charged or arrested for any crime, falsely to move or maintain any suit, action, or proceeding to cheat or defraud any person of any property, like bail, by any means which are in themselves criminal, or to obtain money or property by false pretenses. No charges filed. Hey, you can bail out, but there aren't even any charges filed. How are you held in jail when nobody has sworn that you committed a crime? You see? And then, but you can be released on bail. You know what we're going to call that? We're going to call that extortion. Okay. Penal Code 740. California, except that is otherwise provided by law, all misdemeanors and infractions, that's all traffic stuff, must be prosecuted by written complaint under oath subscribed by the complainant. Such complaint may be verified on information and belief. Well, there's two conflicting statements there. On the one, it says written complaint under oath, and on the other one, such complaint may be verified on information. Like I said, a verification is not in front of somebody else. An oath or affirmation is.